we're going to go back to the beginning of the book. Hmm? Fix my collar because it's bothering my wife. All right. So, Revelation chapter 22. We're going to look at verse 3 real quick. And then we're going to go back to chapter 3 of Genesis. So, verse 3 in Revelation 22 says, And there will no longer be any curse. So we need to kind of go back and get the back, as, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story there. And so what does that curse have to deal with? Well, we go to chapter 3 of Genesis. It tells us there, the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the tree in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat or touch it or you will die. Now she changed some wordage there. If you go back in chapter two, you'll see that. And Satan said, no, you will not die. In fact, God knows when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desire for obtaining wisdom. And so she took some of its fruit and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. And so the Lord called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, The woman you gave me. To be with me, she gave me some of the fruit and of the tree, and I ate it. And so the Lord asked the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. Then we see the curse. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about tonight, uh, to kind of be an interlude for uh, maybe next week, uh, first part of chapter 22 there, uh, about a purpose being fulfilled. Uh, God's going to put an end to this curse. But in the meantime, we're, we're dealing with that. We, we just talked about several needs that we have in our community, outside of our community, in our nation, and in our world. You know, in the beginning, God created man as a perfect, sinless entity. Just think about that. He was created spiritually perfect, physically perfect. Like if you're looking for a perfect man... He came and gone. And intellectually perfect and morally perfect. Adam was a perfect being. He had no taint or no tendency to sin, but he was filled with righteousness and a love for holiness, inclined to follow after God and choose what was right. He was not created equal with God by any stretch of the imagination. Not being like God in power or unchangeability or all-knowing, but both the man and the woman were created in the image of God, in his likeness. They were rational. They were had the ability to understand all sorts of things around them. And they had a responsibility then to mature in God-likeness in a daily rel relationship with God as they walked with God in the garden each day. And God wanted that relationship to be founded in mutual love. God formed both of them, and they were inclined to love him freely with all that they were, and to follow them, follow him, not forcefully out of fear, but because they loved God. And so what we see in the beginning, church, is that we were inclined to listen and obey God, not mindlessly plod along after God to, uh, to turn the other way, but God expected and still expects everyone to obey him out of love for who he is. He is the almighty creator of the universe, the savior, and yet the love of God for man and God's intimate relationship with mankind made us then 
the target of another one of God's creation. Satan. The Bible gives no explanation for the existence of Satan or of evil in the world, but it does tell us that his main sin was pride. And so verse 1 of chapter 3 of Genesis introduces us to the adversary and, and the condition that, that we're going to cover today. We, we, we've seen a lot of Satan character all throughout the book of Revelation, and it states here, the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. Now, when we talk about the serpent in Genesis, I am not picturing a 300-pound python. I'm picturing a little green snake. I, I, I did a survey uh, for uh, Maysville Community when I went to cam on campus there in a, a botany and a biology class because I majored in, in biology. And they had a school outside of Goddard, Kentucky there where they bought a few acres of land on the side of that mountain. If you ever start headed toward Moorhead from Flemingsburg, you'll see the Goddard school sets there. And up behind that school is their project land that they bought. It, there's a little forest. There's a pond with a, with a deck that goes out in it. And it's got a glass bottom where the kids can go out and look down inside the water. And, and we went, me and another boy that was in the class, for extra credit, we went through, they created a trail. We went all through that trail and named all the trees that we saw along so they could make those little signs and put them along so the kids could come along. Oh, this is a pine tree and, and this is a hemlock and this is a maple and this is an oak. And I sat down one day, I, we'd been working quite a bit and I, I sat down underneath this pine tree and I'm sitting there eating a sandwich and drinking uh, my water that I had with me and and this little green snake came down out of one of those pine trees and he sat right here just above my shoulder. And I wasn't scared or anything. It was just a little green snake. He wasn't probably a foot long. And he was kind of cute. Now, I'm not a big snake fan. But he's kind of cute. And when I think about the serpent in Genesis, that's kind of what I'm thinking about. Here's this cute little snake. And Obviously, Eve knew it. At this moment, there was no enmity between the serpent and Eve. Everything was kind of working in harmony. I think they knew this. In fact, this may sound far-fetched, but I think they probably had conversations with this snake before. I think that because she didn't seem, it didn't seem strange to her to talk to him at this point in time. I think they talked with all the animals in the garden. Now, that may seem a little far-fetched. But there's nothing out of the ordinary. The Bible says this is strange. But it does say here that he's crafty. And because he was crafty, I believe Satan took possession of this animal. Literally, Satan disguised him way in a way that was not threatening toward the woman. And so he comes into the garden. Because Satan is a second-rate imitator. And so he comes into the garden, he uses the body of the serpent with whom God had previously pronounced as good. Remember, we go back to chapter 1, and God created all of those animals, and every single one of them was good. And she begins this conversation with this animal. And Satan's strategy is to begin to cast doubt upon the divine word of God. He suggests that God could not possibly mean exactly what he said. Did God really say that you should not eat from any tree in the garden? To which she replies in verse 2 that the woman said, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but there is a couple trees that we're not supposed to eat from. And so there's a little doubt that's brought in. And the note here is that when she actually replies back to the serpent, she adds a few things and she leaves a few things out. And so she actually changes God's wording to fit her idea. So there, there's a lot of serious offenses that Eve actually creates here as she is discussing this with the serpent. And what I want to get today is, what are we going to do in heaven? How do we understand what heaven is like? Because I think one of the things that we, we talked about last week and the week before is our problem to really understand what heaven is going to be like. And we talked about how in, the, in these last later days now, more folks are talking about heaven and they're trying to decipher um, scripture and look at prophecy 
And in, in our actuality, I don't think we have a really good understanding and, and we could even grasp what heaven is going to be like, just to be honest with you. Because we're tainted. We're still dealing with the curse. And I want to prove to you that why we can't fully grasp this idea here. You see, our purpose here in the garden for mankind, our purpose when we get to heaven, will be to love God with all that we are. That is what we're going to do in heaven. And I don't know that we can fully understand all of that. Loving God in its purest sense is worship. It's complete, unadulterated worship. That's what worship is all about, is loving God, adoring God. And beloved, that's what we were made for. We made in His holy image with some of His characteristics, some of His likeness, to mirror His glory in a world that He created. But we choose to be another way. We choose to be different than that. Look here in verse 4 and 5. Satan's reply means to twist the wording around in what God says. And he says, no, you will not die, the serpent said. In fact, God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And, and so isn't that kind of what we try to chase after sometimes? Is to know so much more, to be like God. People even create their own gods. We've got our own image. Every single one of us has a different image of God. You, you, I bet I could ask each one of you, what is God like? And you could give all these descriptors, and some of them would be similar, but there would be some that would be different. And we could ask every single church member, and they would all be a little bit different. And see, knowledge and wisdom, to have our, th our eyes open to things new, to be enlightened and learned, beloved, is, is one of our desires. We want to be totally self-sufficient in and of ourselves, to control what is around us. <laughs> that, that's a problem for us because we can't control every single thing around us. And when our eyes are open, we see and we understand a lot of things that we didn't see and we understand and we understood before. But understanding and seeing actually brings consequences into our life. They carry responsibilities, actually come with a price. Look at verses 6 and 7 in our, in our passages today. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. And so she took its fruit and she ate it. And she gave some to Adam, who was with her. So he's just as guilty here. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. Now, the Bible says they were naked. Let me ask y'all something. Weren't they naked before? Why did they just realize this? Because there were consequences that came with partaking of the fruit. Now they see their innocence has been lost to pride. That's what they gain. The root of their sin is pride. It's the same sin that Satan had. Because they wanted to be like God. They were prideful. You see, beloved, pride actually affects our worship. It's why we can't fully serve God and it's why we can't fully worship God with all that we are because our worship is off because we're prideful. You look at verse 8, you see actually how silly this is. It says here, Then the man and his wife, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, same time God came every single day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. Can you really hide from God? Absolutely not. We can't hide from God. But how many of you can honestly say that you've tried to hide from God? We've all tried to hide from God. Even in our worship service, we hide from God. When, when you feel Him move in your heart or in your mind and you, you try to back out of that or, or He puts a thought in your head and you say, well, no, no, I, I can't think about that right now. I'm, I've got lunch coming up. I've got this to do. There, there's all these tasks that i got to put in front of these things. We have from God all the time. And he seeks us out all the time. He tries to get close to us in our prayer time. Uh, Mark had a beautiful prayer just a little while ago. How many of you, about part of the way through that prayer, were thinking about something else? Maybe you got sidetracked on, maybe just a thought or something here or there. You maybe thought about somebody that, uh, you're one or something else that came up because we do that all the time. And so here in verses 9 and 11, 
So, so God calls out to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. And then he asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from that tree that I told you not to eat from? And, and here's the other thing that we have to ask when we're reading this passage. God has no questions. There, there is not a question that God needs to ask that he does not already know the answer to. And so when God asks something, He's actually asking it for our understanding. It's, it's almost ask, like asking a redundant question. Uh, you, you've got a child that you've told not to eat a piece of chocolate cake, and the cake is on the table, and you go in, and there's chocolate all over their face. The cake is all messed up, and you say, did you eat that cake? You already know the answer to the question. But you want them to hear the questions so that they can then begin to process what is going on here. God already knows what's happening. There's nothing that God needs to ask. Go read through the book of Job. There's all kinds of questions there. God already knows here. But he has to ask them again to get them to begin to process what they just did and understand that discipline is actually coming after this. So they have to think. And he says, who told you that you were naked? Nobody had to tell them. They actually realized it because they were, their eyes had been opened. And he said, did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to? And the answer is obviously yes. They already know that. Why are they hiding from God? And so the man says to the woman, you put her here with me. <laughs> it's her fault. She gave me some of the fruit, then I ate it. It's one of the reasons why I don't always listen to my wife all the time. <laughs> because there's two things that'll get you in trouble, guys. Snakes and women. <laughs> it's a little joke. You got it <laughs> Probably getting me in trouble here when we it. And so Adam passes the buck and he blames Eve. He also blames who? He says, you put her here with me. It's not my fault. First of all, it's her fault for giving it. And it's your fault for bringing her to give it to me. And so he blames God for his sin. Now, God can't sin. God can't even cause us to sin. God, she gave me it. It's her fault. And it's your fault. We do this today. Something typically goes wrong in our life. And most people point the finger at somebody else. I didn't do it. He did it. She did it. We play the blame game every single day. But in reality, when we get to the bottom of it, it's our fault. We make the choices. We fail in serving the one and doing the right thing. And so God says, what is this that you have done? Eve's reply is much the same. She points to the serpent. She said, it's his fault. He deceived me. But really, they have no excuse at all. It's, it's their own fault. The simple answer is it's their problem. And so, so comes the discipline. Now, now comes the curse. Now, we didn't read through the curse, but you guys already know what the curse is because the curse relates to our worship. It affects who we are. Now, I want you to think, because it affects us differently. I want you to think about it. And this is generalized. This is not specific, but it's a generalized thing here. The curse is why we're here right now looking at this because before we look at the rest of Revelation, chapter 22, I want us to understand and grasp what the full view, or for us to grasp what the full view of heaven is, we have to understand that we can't grasp the full view of heaven, okay? Paul tried to articulate in his letters to Rome and Corinth and Ephesus, there is a struggle that each of us have between our old nature and the new nature. Paul even said it in Romans, he said, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I'm always doing those things, and I in hindsight, I come back and say, why did I do that? I am a wretched man. Who is going to save me from this? Well, it's Christ Jesus. That's the only place I can go. I have to plead on the name of Jesus Christ. Mark said it. I mentioned it last Sunday. The only name written under heaven by which men can be saved. I cannot do it in myself. And so there's always this struggle that we're going through every single day. When you wake up, Paul says, I have to kill, I have to die to myself. I got up out of bed this morning. The first thing I'm thinking is, Lord, thank you for this day. I have to kill the self. What do you want me to do today? 
And that's what we go through. And sometimes the self wins out and we do what the self wants to do. And in hindsight, we come back and we say, well, God, why, why did I do that? I knew I shouldn't have did that. There were other things that I needed to do for you. And some days we get out and we're serving God and we're doing what God wants us to do. But Paul talks about this all through his letters. And we have to starve that part of ourself. I heard it explained one time. When we become a Christian, it's like having two dogs in the fight. And one is evil and the other is good. And whichever dog you're feeding the more, that's the one that's going to, that's the one that gets stronger and stronger. And so we look forward to the day, as, as Paul wrote in one of his letters, uh, when we finally, when sin is finally defeated in us, and I'm present with the Lord at home in heaven. Look at verse 16 here in Genesis. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains and you will build children with your painful efforts. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. How does the curse affect Eve's relationship with God? Answer session here. How does, how does the curse affect Eve? What's it mainly dealing with in her life? Her family, right? Her children. She's going to have labor pains. She's going to be uh, dealing with this rule with her husband. In, in, the, in the actual Greek, it's her desire will be to usurp her husband. To, to not listen always to what he has to say because there's a, there's a control issue. That's what it's dealing with here. It's a central thesis of, of, of the curse affects her through her children and her husband. This is her family, church. Generally speaking, ladies, what do you take the most pride in? What is your numero uno thing that you love the most? A outside of God, let's take God out of the picture and say, what are you going to focus on the most? Your families, right? That's number two in your life, right? You know, number two always has the possibility of jumping over number one. And that's where your struggle is going to be. Now, again, this is generalized. This is not specific. There, there are some ladies that are not built this way and they have no care for, for children or husbands or family or anything. But it's your kids, your grandkids, and your husband. That is what defines your life. And see, sometimes what we do is we replace that with God. And that's what our whole world revolves around. We say, yeah, we serve Jesus Christ. We love Jesus Christ. But there's still that sphere that you've got to deal with. You're still in the world. You're dealing with reality and everything that's going on with that. And it's not, it would be unbiblical to not care for your husband and your children or your grandchildren. Okay? Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say we got to neglect them in order to serve God. That, that is wrong thinking 100%. I'm just trying to explain this is a result of the fall. And that lessens your worship because you got to deal with that. And here's an example. What happens to your worship on Sunday morning? Let's just say our generalized worship on Sunday morning. When something that the kids are doing on the way to church is, is driving you crazy or your husband and you get in an argument, how does that affect your worship when you come in here? Are you walking through the doors and everything is spot on and I'm ready, I'm good to go? Or is that still playing in the back of your mind? Still playing in the back of your mind, right? And guys, it's the same for us some too. Don't get me wrong. But that affects our worship. Because we're still dealing with this curse. Now guys, I don't want to pick on the ladies only tonight. So let's look at us for a second. Verses 17 through 19. And he said to the man, because listen to, you listen to your wife and you ate from the tree about which I commanded you. Do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. And you will eat from it by means of painful labor all of the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat after the plants of the field. You'll eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground. Since you were taken from it, for you are dust and dust you will return to. Guys, what, what do we find our purpose in? Work. Exactly right. <clears throat> Our job. I, I guarantee you, ask any man what defines him, and it'll be his work. 
we base, guys, we base our, our, our worth, our value on what we do. And think about this for a second. If you ask a guy that, what, what do you do? If he says, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm some sort of professional, we garner that as he is so successful. You ask a different guy and he says, I'm a janitor. Not, not to say that's any less, but you pick some of these jobs that, that aren't all that professional. And what do we, we do we say that's successful? I mean, you pick a median wage job and this guy works at McDonald's, he's making, you know, six, seven dollars an hour. He's under the poverty line. Is he successful? I mean, we, would we consider that successful? Probably not. But there are plenty of guys that work at those places that are way, do way more than that. I heard a story, it was on uh, the gentleman, I don't know which affiliate station he works for, but he travels all over the United States and he finds those positive, you know, people that are out there. And he found this guy that gets so excited, works at Wendy's drive through and everybody in that town knows this guy because every time that they come through the drive through he not only gives them their food, but he has something positive to say about it. And they said, sometimes we just go through the drive through just to talk to the guy. He's successful. I mean, he says, I can't imagine getting up any day and doing anything else but this. But we define ourselves by our work. We find our purpose in what we do. And we generally judge a man by what he does for a living. Because that's how we base our success. Now again, that affects our worship. And again, I'm not saying for a guy that we leave all that behind. Because scripture teaches if you don't work, you don't eat. And a man has to take care of his family. And if he doesn't, he, the Bible pretty much says he's worthless. But again, it's a result of the fall. And so how do we remedy this? How can we fix this problem when we are actually part of the problem itself? Well, God has to fix it. That's the only way it can be remedied is through Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He redeemed us so that by faith we might receive the promise. So what are we looking for here? What did God say from the throne room in Revelation chapter 21, verse 6? It is done. God says, I've got the remedy for the problem. Happened on the cross.